Good morning, this is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from Miami Beach, home of Neurosurgical TV. We have the pleasure of having Ashish Tandon, M MD, a neurosurgeon from India, who is, <clears throat> who is starting to do end neuroendoscopy uh, in, in like an interactive setting. And he'll tell you what he's going to talk about today. Okay, Ashish, uh, I'll turn it over to you. It's all yours and welcome. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, John, once again. And uh, uh, I'll quickly switch on my screen share. Is that on now? Yes, it's on now. Great. So uh, let me introduce myself briefly. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Ashish Tandon, and uh, uh, I'm working here at... Um, uh, central part of uh, the country. It's called, uh, the name of the town is Jabalpur. Uh, it is a very vibrant city and a lot of uh, neurosurgical activity in here. Uh, is, uh, uh, let me, what is TMUH? My Q, TMUH. Mike, are you there? Anyone Hello. can answer. Mike is there from TMUH. Mm. Is it? Mm. Okay, okay. Well, anyway, so uh, I, I'll take you through the second part of uh, my lecture. Uh, the first part, uh, if you have missed on it, uh, on the lecture, then you can visit Neurosurgical TV. TV and uh, that I had focused mainly on uh, uh, transforaminal pure endoscopic procedures. Uh, today, I would be focusing on full endoscopic interluminal lumbar surgery. So lumbar canal stenosis and uh, uh, lumbar discectomies, cyst, etc., etc. So, uh, uh, I think I'll uh, jump in right away. the The pattern of this uh, talk today is: please feel free to interrupt me anytime, anytime that you wish to. If you have a question, I'll be more than happy to answer. Uh, then uh, uh, there is a. Uh, question answer uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, box wherein you can type in your questions uh, or you can just unmute yourself and ask questions. Uh, the best thing would be to uh, not keep it to you and just, you know, sort of share or ask. Fine. So uh, these are the same set of disclosures that I had the last time, only 30% of my uh, lumbar work is uh, transforaminal. Uh, rest, 70% is interlaminar, which we would be speaking today. And when I speak of, when I talk of interlaminar, uh, what I mean is pure endoscopic or full endoscopic or the tubular approach. So I'm, I do both. I am, uh, I'm in love with the tubular approach though I would not be talking about it today. Maybe uh, the, uh, some other day we will take up a talk on mist lift and tubular approaches. I think each one who is a spine enthusiast and MIS enthusiast should, should learn the tubular approach. It has a very basic learning curve. It is not steep. You can pick it up very quickly. As far as interlaminar is concerned, uh, I use the same set of uh, uh, equipments as for transforaminal discectomy. Uh, for canal stenosis, though, I use a larger diascope, but it's sort of shorter in length. Uh, I don't know why my cursor is not working today. Your cursor is not working? Uh, 
John, uh, just give me a minute. My yeah, cursor sure. is not working. So sure. okay. let me figure that out. Okay. Uh, just we can all relate to technical problems. Yeah, the course is working now, it looks like. Uh, yeah, it's working in in this situation, but when I, like I can, if I make the screen full, then the, it, it sort of oh, you're trying Can you to see move the it. cursor? Right yes, now? I can see the cursor. Uh, can, can you see the cursor? Yes, we can see the cursor. Okay, that's good. So I'll just go this way. Let's see. Okay. Uh, right. So as I was telling you, for canal stenosis, I would tend to use a larger diameter scope, which is shorter in length. So that sort of gives me an advantage. The other disclosure is that I routinely perform MIS endoscopic surgeries. It forms bulk of my uh, operative work, MIS, as well as endoscopic, both cranial and spine. In fact, I started off with cranial and that is uh, that is uh, sort of helped me understanding or moving from three anatomy to understanding 2D and me because I'm, I was trained basically initially in, on the microscope and then gradually uh, I picked up on endoscope. So uh, you, one has to get trained uh, to the anatomy. Uh, also, as uh, for uh, all surgeons, it's very true for me as well. I've had fair shares of my failures and complications, more so uh, in the initial learning curve. Uh, but as the experience has grown, uh, the number of complications, though they still happen, but uh, they have, uh, the percentage has reduced. Now, this is where I would want to uh, really talk about uh, whoever is interested in pure or full endoscopic interlaminar uh, approach. Uh, you have to understand that there is a very steep learning curve. So, when I say steep learning curve means you have to do a good number of cases to really get a hang of the instruments, of the anatomy, of what is good in your hands, so on and so forth. Uh, secondly, what I would want to tell you is, in my previous lecture, I told that transforaminal understanding the anatomy is difficult. There, there is a process of learning that because we are, have not been trained to go through the transforaminal approach. But as far as handling the instruments is concerned, because in transforaminal, the sheath is fixed in the foramen, you just need to move the endoscope and you can um, sort of perform the surgery. Here in interlaminal, Understanding the anatomy is very easy because we are going through the interlaminar approach and we have been doing that uh, since we have started neurosurgery. But here, sort of uh, manipulating the instruments is uh, very difficult because in one hand, uh, and I'll show that, in one hand you have the endoscope and the sheath, both. So you're controlling both of them. So sort of uh, getting a hang of the instruments is a little challenging. Then uh, what are the indications for interlaminar approach? Okay, so uh, I hope uh, nobody has a question as far as interlaminar approach is concerned. Interlaminar is like we are going right through the posterior midline, okay? unlike transforaminal where we are going from the lateral. So what are my indications for uh, a pure interlaminar uh, endoscopic surgery? It's specifically L5-S1 disc prolapse. I would not 
think or not attempt a transforaminal now, I am very happy going with a full endoscopic for all L5 S1 disc prolapse. For L3, 4, L4, 5, or for lumbar discs, which are calcified, I'll go in for an interlaminar approach rather than in a transforaminal. Again, a highly migrated disc, which I would not be doing justice if I uh, went through a transforaminal approach, I would pick in the interlaminar approach. So if I go here, this is a typical L5 S1 disc. All L5 S1 discs I would attempt through a interlaminar endoscopic approach. Then uh, a highly migrated disc, this like this is L4-5 and a highly migrated disc I won't be performing justice if I went through a transforaminal approach because not only would I be injuring the exiting root here, uh, I may not be able to extract out this disc. So uh, for a highly migrated disc, I would go in for a interlaminar, even if it is at L3, 4, L4, 5. Then all calcified discs. For me, the minute you have a calcified disc, I would not attempt it through a transforaminal. There are few who may, but in my hands, I feel I'm more comfortable doing a interlam approach. Uh, the other indications uh, would be lateral recess stenosis, central canal stenosis, spinal canal cyst. Now, lateral recess stenosis and central canal stenosis, again, I am very comfortable using an interlaminar uh, over the top approach. I'll share one of my videos with you, wherein I will demonstrate that you can do a very, very good job through a eight or 10 millimeter incision. So these are my indications for interlaminar approach. Okay. Now you have, what I really want you all to, is to understand the anatomy, how it is different from what we are doing. And the anatomy is not different. It's our understanding. What we need to look in the X-ray and in the MRI to sort of uh, uh, take a good approach, take uh, better decisions. So now look here. This is a typical L5 S1 disc, which is almost within the discal borders in, in the sense this, the height, it has not migrated superiorly or inferiorly. Fine. This is the spinous process of L4 and this is the, uh, sorry, L5 and this is the spinous process of S1. Now look at the axial cuts. This is the higher cut. So somewhere around here. And this is the lower cut, which would be somewhere around here. Fine. Now look here, you have the lamina and the spinous process. So when you are trying to attempt from here, you would require to deal with this uh, lamina here to reach to the disc. Is that clear? But suppose if I come here, there is no bone, there is no, there is interlaminar ligamentum flavum direct. So my endoscope sheath reaches to the ligamentum flavum direct. There's no bone uh, in here. Okay. So I'll keep on harping on this again and again so that you understand what you need to see on the MRI. Okay. So let's go on to the next photograph and look here. Why we select L5-S1? So all L5-S1 we can easily do through an interlaminar and this is a beautiful photograph, a CT scan to demonstrate. Now suppose you have a disc herniation here and you want to attempt from a transforaminal approach. So this iliac crest is going to come in your way. So your sheath would be coming somewhere from here and it would be going down. Not a good, not a good trajectory, not a good approach. Now what God has done already ready-made for us is this is the disc here. 
there is a good interlaminar window. I just take my scope in here and excise the disc, period. Hardly any bone drilling. So for most of the cases of L5 S1, especially which are within, or I would say at the disc level or a little bit caudally migrated, you don't need any drilling of the lamina. However, if there is severe cranial migration, you may need to drill a bit of it. Okay. Uh, now I'll stop for a minute or so. If, uh, if the participants have any questions, they are free to ask me. If you have any questions till now, because I want you to understand the anatomy and what we are looking to it. Can you please maximize your uh, slides so we can see them clearer? Oh, 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 okay. I'm so sorry. So in that case, I have to have a... Uh, there you go. When I maximize it, my uh, cursor is not seen. So let me... Uh, let me take... Okay. That's okay if you can't do it. That's okay. No, but I have to show, uh, John, I have to show those structures. Because okay. if I'm not able to show those structures, okay. uh, let me find out some okay. other way. Uh, then the other thing that I can do is I can take slide only. Has this increased the size? Uh, it looks about not the much? same. No, it looks about the same. You want to enlarge the slide, correct? Yeah, I want to enlarge the slide. Okay, on the, far, on the left to... hand side, it has zoom the percentage on the le upper left. Try that. Uh, upper left, it says zoom 119%. Maybe if you enlarge that. Yeah, uh, I, I'll, first let me just try to get the uh, cursor. Let okay. me just try. Okay. I, I'll just try that first. So, slideshow. Show pointer when using. There we go. Well, okay. learning, the, learning the interface. <laughs> That's it. Now I have the cursor. Okay. Uh, friends, is that okay now? Excellent. Thank you. Uh, okay. Now, uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, I want you to ask specific questions. Okay. Before, before I um, allow you that, just see the anatomy of L4-5 here. You see the interlaminar window here? Do you see? Yes. So yes. The, the issue with the interlaminar window here is the, the spinous process is coming a little down. If you look at S1 spinous process, it's flat. Okay? So it is not obstructing in any way your uh, interlaminar window. Okay? Secondly, the interlaminar window at L4-5 is not good. And usually, uh, uh, there is hardly, you have to do bone work up to this point to really get the disc excision if you want to attempt a L4-5. So I would say a straightforward L4-5 would be better dealt through a transforaminal approach. Now, why transforaminal over interlam in such cases? Because uh, we have data that transforaminal is the least invasive of all approaches. Okay? But uh, th that's absolutely true. Even in my practice, I find that if I do a decent, good, quick transforaminal approach, the patient himself wants to go home the same evening or, you know, uh, he wants to get mobilized pretty soon. Uh, on the other hand, interlam approach, uh, any approach for that matter, a microdiscectomy, a tubular, a distandu, or this, the full endoscopic, because we are going through the multifidus muscle, there is more pain and more invasiveness in the interlam approach. So, Whenever you can do a transforaminal for say for L4-5, L3-4, good. If you're not happy, comfortable, 
or comfortable, then we can use the interlam approach. But I wanted you all to understand this anatomy because when you are approaching, when you are reading the MRI, you should be very clear in your mind how much of lamina you have to drill. And when you are shooting an X-ray and when you're keeping your instrument on the lamina, on the superior lamina, you should exactly know how much lamina you want to drill. All of this, uh, it'll be, uh, you can, you would be able to understand as my slides progress. But still, if you have any question till now, please feel free to ask. Let me just say, you also can text any questions. Feel free if you don't want to go on video, just text the questions or comments. Okay, none so far. Okay. Okay, so let's go on to the... Okay, so I have discussed the anatomy with you. Now I would discuss the technique. And as I told you, L5-S1 disc herniation is, uh, is the main uh, area where you are going to use full endoscopic. You don't need any different set of equipments. The same, I use the same scope. So you don't need to invest more money on any fresh uh, instruments. And uh, the only thing is uh, you need a little more height. Uh, I, I'll show it to you in some photographs. So this is the uh, uh, L5S1 disc herniation. How I position, this is a very short video. So what I do is I flex. So there is flexion and there is reverse trend. So basically I break the table. Okay. Um, once again, if you see the flexion is going to increase here. See, the flexion is increasing. And why? Now, there is a scientific reason for this. One, you are decreasing the lumbar lordosis that you really want. You don't want a lot of uh, lumbar lordosis. So, uh, you're making it a little flat. And secondly, you are opening up the interlaminar window. Okay? So, how does the interlaminar window open up? So let's see this video. You see, this is the facet joint. And when you're flexing, look at the interlaminar window here. It is increasing. So you need less of bone drilling. So it's not about just drilling the bone. It's also about the time consumed because you have smaller instruments while you're doing endoscopy. And endoscopy or minimally invasive surgery is all about being more and more precise. Okay? It's like just going to the pathology, dealing with the pathology and coming out. That is, uh, 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 in a nutshell, the whole uh, ethos or crux about MIS. So, for MIS, you need to have the right position. You need to have the right set of equipments so that you know what you're dealing with, okay? Again, I'll show you this video. So, sorry, 13 second video. So when you are positioning the patient, you, you get a better interlamp window, fine. Now, once can the I patient ask, is- Can I ask a question? Yes, yes, yes please, please, please. I, I noticed from your position that you are putting the patient in prompt position without anything under his abdomen. Uh, no, no, no. Or you, or, you is, are, uh, or you are keeping a Wilson frame. This is, uh, I use flat bolster. This is, this black thing is yeah. my flat bolster here, here and on the opposite side. Ah, okay, so uh, the, abdomen, this, the abdomen is free. Yeah, abdomen is absolutely free. It needs to be free. And also, okay. uh, you have to be very, very cautious here because 
uh, see in open or in tubular approaches, you have a lot of ways to control the bleeding. I mean the venous bleeding or bleeding secondary to raised intra-abdominal pressure. Okay. Which you, here you have very limited opportunities. So, uh, and I would also advise all of the youngsters that even for a disc, when you're doing initial few cases, get the blood pressure lower down, get the peak pressure on the ventilator lower down, use Trenexa, because I feel Trenexa has helped me decrease the bleeding, no abdominal pressure, so that your surgery is more smooth. What and is Trenexa? Trenexamic acid. Trenexamic acid is, uh, is um, if I tell you technically, it prevents the, uh, it inhibits the uh, fibrinogen degradation. So the clot that is formed does not degrade. And so there is better hemostasis. Okay. If you read recent papers, we have, I have been using Trenexa for more than three to five years in all my complicated spine. So all pedicle screws, trauma, my uh, deformities, I would be using trenexamic acid. But now there is a recent benchmark paper uh, uh, in, new, uh, in one of the neurosurgical journals which suggests that even in head injuries, whenever the patient comes to you, especially if he is coming early in transfused trenexa so that his clot contusion does not increase. Well, that is apart from this. So this was a little bit on trenexa. So what, uh, what I wanted to uh, uh, tell my uh, viewers is that use each and every way to decrease intra bleeding. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether you are able to appreciate here. Generally, I keep the mean arterial pressure between somewhere around 70. Okay. Somewhere around 70, I keep uh, that. That is the best. Uh, that I feel. Okay. Okay. This I have shared. This I have shown. Okay. Now, uh, when uh, when uh, I start uh, uh, my uh, marking, what I do is I take a K wire, and my K wire, as you can appreciate, is somewhere near the middle part of the disc. And like this patient had a left-sided disc herniation or, or right, I'm not sure right now. So whichever, so I'll just be a little medial to the lateral window, the lateral interlaminar window, because the whole action is going to be here. Okay. So this is where I need to dissect. Okay. So once I have marked this, I place a incision and okay, this again, I would like to show the uh, preparation. My assistant has already prepared the endoscope. I am giving an incision here. <coughs> this, uh, this is a spinal sheath uh, and uh, there's a lot of water that would be, uh, you know, coming in because it is again surgery being done under irrigation. So the irrigant would be falling down here into the uh, into the dustbin. Okay, and one of my assistants is standing on the opposite side. He or she would be feeding the instruments into the endoscope. Okay. So uh, I would make, uh, if I'm using a smaller scope, an eight millimeter uh, incision. And I'll take the incision till the patia. And here I directly use the dilator. Just, I go right in into the interlaminar window. Here again, you have for the beginners, uh, what you can do is, instead of really going in and then puncturing the ligament and, the, and injuring the dura, you can try to hit any of the bone. You can try to hit the lower lamina 
or you can hit the upper lamina. Okay, I will suggest to hit the lower lamina and uh, ligamentum flavum border. Okay, but you can choose either whichever you are comfortable with, so that you know that you are not injuring the ligamentum, you are not creating a dural rent, and you know your apprehension is not increasing. Okay, so. There's a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, yes, yeah, yes, John. So here I, I have my uh, sheet. Once I, uh, sorry, my dilator, and uh, once I have uh, fixed my dilator, I would shoot an X-ray. So I'll just uh, take a uh, few of the questions. T M U H. Yes. Uh, so what is T M U H? Is it Technical University of Munich, or I'm not sure what T M U H is. Uh, if lumbar vertebra is sacralized, then what we use? Well, if it even if it is sacralized, you have to see the the ella of uh, uh, sorry the uh, iliac crest. If your disc herniation level <coughs> on an AP X-ray, if the iliac crest is above it, and you feel that transforaminal is difficult, go through an interlam approach. So that you can decide based on the X-ray. You don't need to worry whether it is lumbarized, sacralized. You just see the iliac crest and take a decision. That's number one. Uh, it's Ninath has, yes, it's an antifibrinolytic agent. Uh, do you use IV or local? Altaf has asked, okay. So uh, uh, Altaf, if you read uh, certain papers on Trenexa, you will find that you start with a bolus dose of 10 milligram per kg. So for me, for a 70 kilo patient, I would usually, uh, in my anesthetist would give a gram of Trenexa. And thereafter, I use one milligram per kg per hour. So a continuous IV. That's number one. Number two, when my uh, juniors and assistants are closing, when the dura has been secured, closed, uh, uh, or if the dura has not been opened in uh, 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 where the bony work is only done, then what we do is we put in the drain and we inj uh, uh, not inject, we just flush, flush the wound with local Trinexa and we allow it to be there for three to five minutes. So in that three to five minutes, either we'll be putting the drain or we'll be, uh, you know, uh, securing hemostasis, things like that. And once three to, or injecting local into the wound. So we use those three minutes and I, I, I can vouch for it that your bleeding reduces a lot, maybe by 60 to 70%. So please use it regularly. It is a wonder drug. Till now, there are certain uh, caveats though. You, you should avoid using in cardiac patients. There, there is one or two more, I think, DVT patients, so on and so forth. So um, uh, I think, uh, so I use both IV and local. Uh, okay. What is the skin landmark for skin incision? Well, I, I've already told you, Harshad, that I put on AP, I just put a, a K wire in the midline. So my point, end of the K wire is reaching to the spine. Suppose this is the spinous process on an AP. I'll be touching just lateral to the spinous process. Okay, just lateral to the spinous process. I'll try to be bang in the center of the area of disc herniation. So I will see the MRI. On MRI SAGE, I know the center of the disc herniation. So let me, uh, you've asked a very good question. So suppose this is the disc herniation, okay? So what I would try to do is, this is the center of the herniated fragment. 
So I would try to be here, okay? And in L5S1, generally you will find that we bring the sheath and trocar from below and up. It is easier to go up rather than come down, okay? So that's about this. Uh, I hope, uh, Harshal, I've answered your question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, now, so I use a longitudinal incision, not a transverse incision. I use a longitudinal incision, which is around eight millimeters. Are you using easy go system? No, not at all, Kesar. It is a full endoscopic. So when you use a use easy go, there is a tube. That is what I call tubular. You are calling easy go. That I use only for missed T lifts or when I combine a Wilsey approach with decompression. So that is where I use easy go for dyskinesis and single level stenosis. I would use a, a full endoscopic and I'll show you the video. So, so it will become clearer. Okay. <clears throat> Does Trenexa infusion increases the risk of DVT? I, I think so. Uh, there must be an increased risk. And uh, that is why in, uh, in certain group of patients or cardiac risk patients, it has to be avoided or maybe you can reduce the dose. Please explain how uh, to do skin mark. I think I've already explained. If still you have uh, any more question or if you have not understood, then I'll explain it once again. <clears throat> okay, fine. So I, I think let's move on. Okay. Now, so see, this is my uh, incision. It's a longitudinal incision. This is the draping that I do. It's a very small incision. This is, I don't use needle. Though if you, if you want, you can use a needle first and this sheath will go through the needle. Uh, so here, and I'm just feeling uh, here, I think I'm feeling the bone. Okay. And after that, I use a sheet. Now this, th this is a bigger sheet that I'm using, bigger dilator and scope. As I told you, I use two, one is eight, uh, in fact, 7 mm uh, scope and the other is 9 mm scope. So here the sheath is going over the dilator. I'm sorry, I, okay. I need to mute. Okay, now this is the endoscope. Now look carefully. Uh, is it a video? Okay, yeah. Now see my assistant here, sorry. My assistant, this, this here is the irrigation fluid that would be attached to one similar port on the other side. So he is attaching the irrigation. Again, I am not using pumps. I use gravity, but if you want, pumps are very good, especially if it is bleeding. Here I check the white balance uh, and uh, the focus, zoom, left, right, this is a 25 degree forward looking scope. Now, in my last lecture also, I had um, discussed about this, that in endoscopy till now, wherever you need to do procedures, 15 to 25, 30 degree scopes are best for performing procedures. Why? Because when the instrument comes in, you are able to see the instrument first. Okay. And then you can sort of target the neural structure. So be it ETVs, I use 25 degrees, colloid cyst, 25 degrees, intraventricular tumors, for CP angle tumors, for all types of spine that I do, I would use a 25 degree scope. Okay. Uh, I use a high definition camera system. Uh, okay, now this is very, very important. Okay, so as far as interlaminar technique is concerned, there is nothing to anatomy, you know, in easy go system or distandu or micro discectomy, you are seeing from behind. So if this is the theca, there's ligamentum flavum here and you see from above you, cut the ligamentum flavum, see the theca root and do the surgery. Very similar for interlam as well. 
but here this is not a fixed system neither the sheath nor the scope is fixed it's a joystick okay it's a joystick you can take up down you know so that is why there is a steep learning curve to handling the instruments and now please understand that how to hold the scope so these fingers here sort of help me keep the sheath inside <clears throat> and my thumb is thumb and the rest of the hand is holding the scope and from the other hand i put the instrument in so here if you can appreciate and at times when you feel that you know you need some support you can ask your uh, assistant but usually it is not required and the assistant is helping you in feeding the uh, instruments now uh, also uh, the irrigation is controlled through this switch here if if i want to speed up like when i started off i used to use almost 30 liters of fluid and then gradually it has come down because now we understand when to increase the pressure when to decrease it so on and so forth the other thing i would want you to look at in this photograph is uh, is these two bottles now this is a 3 liter irrigation bottle and this is a 1 liter irrigation bottle wrapped with a pressure uh, system so i use this typically and there are controls and this i use when there is lot of bleeding and i want more pressure the irrigation to be more so that is the time when i use this okay so uh, let's move on okay so uh, the, the as i have told you the instruments remain the same you have the same bipolars they work very well under the irrigation not a issue okay now for l5s1 disc as i told you this the the dilator comes here and it is sort of i have established it near the bone and then i have taken i am taking the sheath in and the dilator has been removed so this is how you sort of dock now what i'll do is i'll start sharing few of my videos they are also on youtube or uh, uh, here as well um, and you can sort of go again and again and uh, review these uh, videos so this was a hard disk uh, a hard and large disk and this is a, a good disk herniation with caudal migration here you can appreciate a uh, left sided uh, disk okay now look here this this is the sheath okay the scope is inside the sheath because that is why you are able to see part of the sheath this here is ligamentum flavor at l5 s1 level okay fine here i am using a through cut or a ligamentum flavum cutter the important thing to learn here is that when you are cutting unlike in open surgeries or microscopy microscopic surgeries where we cut the ligamentum flavum in one go so we take the whole ligamentum flavum and we punch it then we take another the complete thickness of the ligamentum flavum and we cut it here we cut it in layers okay so here i am cutting the as you can appreciate i am cutting the ligamentum flavum in layers here i have opened the ligamentum flavum and you can see the uh, fat so this i have opened up now this is a very small opening in the ligamentum flavum so why is it small because see the sheath in itself is a 8 mm sheath and this opening in the ligamentum flavum is about 1/3 or so and i have stretched it 
so by about 2 to 3 mm of opening of the ligamentum flammarum you can go inside the ligamentum flammarum you can expand and you can go inside that is the advantage of interlam approach a pure endoscopic or full endoscopic interlam approach that the uh, lubricancy of the epidural tissue is maintained can you close the the lubricancy because there is less of fibrosis this is uh, maintained okay so here you can see that i have opened the ligamentum flavor okay what i am doing here is i have taken my sheath inside and this is a long sort of a dissector and i am separating the root from the edge of the facet okay medial edge of the facet sorry okay so i am pushing the root aside and now what i have done is as i showed you the sheath the last time in transfer hymenal it is a beveled sheath so initially my opening of the bevel is towards the theca medially but once i have dissected i turn the uh, uh, sheath so that the longer part is acting as a root retractor okay oh, oh. time and again okay so here i am using this as the root retractor my sheet opening up the annulus and then there is nothing more to it just remove the disc okay as we do the advantage here is you can very well go inferiorly and superiorly to confirm that you have done a complete job you know here like i am i am visualizing the s1 root and i can see that there is no fragments and i can bring i can take out the sheath and you know confirm that all the roots and theca are free okay so these are the root and theca this is part of the axilla here and you get a very beautiful view uh through this approach okay and this was the large single fragment that had come out apart from other fragments and here what i am trying to show you the extent see I, here i have gone to the lower part so my instrument is gone here the sheet and here if you can see my uh, electrode rf electrode is reaching almost to the upper part so i am pretty sure <coughs> that you know uh, through an x ray that you know i have covered the whole extent radiologically as well these are the set of instruments that i use uh okay so i'll again take up few questions if there are because i i think you must have absorbed the surgery so let's see what what's the question if ligamentum flavum is thick or calcified okay so no problem if if if, if it is thick you can deal with uh, it very similarly it doesn't matter and because i would be showing you one of the videos of canal stenosis as well so uh, wherein you generally find the ligamentum to be very thick and buckled you can very easily deal with it as far as uh, uh uh as far as uh, what was the question calcification of the ligamentum flavum so if it is calcified then uh, you if you require to do use drill you can use drill or you can be a little patient go around and you can cut it what do you do when there is an accidental csf leak okay fine now if you have an accidental csf leak wherein the roots are not herniating out and you in fact i'll i'll pose this question in a different way if if you have a dural cut but the arachnoid is intact nothing to worry if the arachnoid has been breached as well and the roots are coming out if you are able to push it in just push it in stop the uh, irrigation for a while get the gel foam in 
and you can come come out if you have made a major uh, if you have done a major injury then obviously you will need to convert it into a micro approach okay and uh, i what i would suggest is do not hesitate in converting it into a micro discectomy uh, so that you are able to do a good repair especially in your initial few cases uh, you know uh, the mistake i used to make in my initial few cases was that i used to think that i am at the shoulder so suppose if this is the how 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 do i show you if this is the root and this is the theca so this is the traversing and this is one of the roots generally we take the dissector here and push it to get to the disc what i was doing was i was coming in here and as i was retracting there was an element of injury to the dura so the uh, the important tip or trick that i can give you is that in all cases especially l4 5 l3 4 you have to drill the facetal part the ascending facet so that part of it so that you can really go lateral you know you can really go lateral i'll take you to that uh, slide where i can show you what i i'm sorry i'm going in back and forth okay this was the slide now look here see if you have to drill a part of uh, the bone here do not hesitate to get to the lateral margin of the root and the theca that's very important more so in l4 5 and l3 4 as i told you see <coughs> look at the opening here and look at the opening here so here you will have to drill a part of the bone here and you have excellent burrs which are available uh, i use a very uh, indian sort of uh, uh, drill i use a manman to attach and i do the drilling i'll show it to you you can use all sort of fancy drills okay uh, what do you do when there is a, okay in my experience just gel foam closure invariably leads to csf leak yes you are absolutely correct Uh, there is uh, a good chance that with gel foam uh, there would be an element of stress leak but you have to understand that here when you are removing the sheath the defect that you have created is so tight that the amount of csf leak to happen is much less than we what we see with tubulars and with uh, open approaches micro discectomy approaches because the water has lot of uh, real free space to you know <coughs> i'm sorry free space to uh, exit so the chances of csf leak is uh, higher with an open approach with, with these approach if you have a small leak then you may uh, you know uh, you may not require to do anything so in in if i look at my numbers in maybe around 10% or 15% i would require to convert if there is a csf leak otherwise generally i do a good skin suture make the patient uh, lie down for uh, uh, 48 to 72 hours and the patient is fine okay but uh, th this this uh, the I, i would say that you can take a call case to case uh, if you want to sort of uh, open up you can open it up or maybe you can uh, watch for 48 hours and then take a call okay uh, why are you using rf electrode okay rf electrodes are being used for two or three reasons the first reason is these uh, rf bipolars are long and they are flexible so you can take them to any direction once you are inside so they will sort of bend so that is number 1 number 2 rf i use at 4 megahertz and uh, there are 4.5 6 megahertz they work very well the electrical transmission is very low and chances of injury to the root is very less 
So that is why RF has become more and more popular. It is also very effective underwater. Though all bipolars work very well underwater, but RF works extremely well under water. Uh, okay. So if there are no further questions till now, then we'll go ahead. So this is Geet here. I had a couple of questions, if you please allow. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, please. Uh, sir, as you said, uh, the RF is flexible and long. However, if... Oh, uh, yeah. Hi, Geet. Yes, sir. Geet, Geet Gupta. Yeah, hi, hi. So, if there is a bipolar which is again a, a semi-flexible and 30 centimeter long, let's assume which fits your scope, uh, plus reusable, uh, autoclavable reusable, will that solve a purpose or still... Oh, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, basically, uh, when we say RF, uh, uh, RF, we, uh, we more often than not mean the machine which is generating the RF right, and not just the probe. So if okay. the probe is reusable, uh, then a lot of money can be saved and uh, uh, we also, uh, what I have through my experience learned that when we are using RF, uh, the electrode, and using normal cautery machine, the life of the electrode is very less, sort of tends to burn away. <clears throat> Whereas when, when we are using a reusable uh, RF uh, or bipolar, then you can connect it to the various types of cautery machines that are available with us. So that is a big leap uh, as far as uh, surgery is concerned. So, thank you, Geet, for raising this point. Uh, Thanks, sir. I have uh, two more basic questions, sir, if you allow. Yeah, yeah please. Uh, the shape of the sheet, sir, uh, one is straight cut, the second is oblique, and the second one is U-oblique, the, the double oblique one. Which one do you prefer for uh, interlaminar approach, or you use more than one sheet, uh, depending upon type of case? Okay. So, uh, if, if I am doing, I'll clarify the question for the interest of the other participants. What he is asking is, do I use a single sheet or do I use two sheets in the sense one big for doing say stenosis and then for a discectomy, I bring in another sheet. So that is what his question is. And as I told you, there is a bevel. So he, there are different types of bevel. So uh, the other question is, uh, uh, what type of bevel do I use? So, for canal stenosis, if it is a severe canal stenosis and I need to do a lot of bone work, or if it is too level, then I would definitely go in for a bigger sheet first, and then take in the smaller sheet. However, if it is a single level stenosis, single disc, not a lot of problem, uh, then I can do everything through a eight millimeter scope. I don't need to get in like what, what scope you can see here. Uh, th this, uh, I can very well do everything single level beat stenosis over the top decompression <coughs> foraminotomies. I'll show you a video where I've done a foraminotomy, uh, and I will expose both the roots. So that, that all is possible, uh, through just this scope. But if we are discussing about the scope, you will see that look at the height of my assistant and where am I? Because I am standing on a small stool. Why? Because this is an 18 centimeter long scope. And generally, <coughs> when you are doing an interlamp, there are a little smaller size scope by about three to four centimeters. But I don't think so. Just for that much, you need to uh, uh, sort of uh, purchase another scope. Or, so that, that's what I feel. The other thing, uh, if, uh, if the participants can observe here, look, look at my shoulder. If I continue using 
my shoulder like this, it is going to fatigue. In any case, my thumb is going to fatigue. My hand is going to fatigue because of the grip. So you have to see <coughs> that the table height is as low as possible to, you know, so that your shoulder height is not like this. It has to be 90 or less so that you, you know, this does not get fatigued. Okay, but I, I think we are going into too many intricacies, but still these are uh, very valid points, very valid questions which need to be answered. Now, uh, Harshad has asked one more question. Do you advise complete disc removal? If disc is hard or fibrous, what do you do? Well, uh, by complete disc uh, removal, what, uh, I, what I remove is free fragments. So I would remove the herniation and the free fragments which are lying within the disc. So free nucleus pulposus part. But I'm not doing a end plate to end plate discectomy. That is not required, not advised, lot of back pain. So you are converting a simple case into a complicated case. As far as disc is hard, is, uh, hard we have good, uh, you know, uh, trifines with this set. So you can just trifine the disc or you can use a chisel that also is uh, available. Or you can use uh, uh, drills. Drills may not be that safe, but you can use chisels. You can very well use trifines. Okay. So let's move on. Uh, okay. Okay. Now, I've shared this with you, right? Okay, instruments. Okay, this is another case just to demonstrate. Uh, this is a L45 disc here. And uh, I chose this because in few cuts, I felt that I may need to excise the ligamentum as well. I've shown you these instruments. I use the sheath uh, with the scope. Again, here I brought this video to show you that in L4, at L45 level, you have to use a drill uh, or a burr. Here I am uh, retracting the root. And again, you will see the rotation of the sheath. So I have rotated the sheath here. And then finally, I am removing the disc. Now, these are fine instruments and you really need to handle them with care. They are costly and you don't want them to break. So, uh, you can use a lot of trifines and, uh, uh, you know, dissectors first. Free up the fragments so that the life of your instruments uh, increases. Also, if you can appreciate, because you are viewing through a 25 degree forward view, so you are able to see under the root, okay? You can see under the root. And in microdiscectomy or in tubulars, when we find that, you know, removing under the root anteriorly, you're not able to visualize. Here, you see, you can visualize it very well and you can take your instrument and uh, peel it off. Okay? So this was post-discectomy. This was the fragment here. Okay, this is another case. There, there was an element of uh, severe stenosis in this lady here. There was ligamentum flavum along with a large disc. So <clears throat> this is what I had done here. So I have removed part of the lamina. I have removed, I have done over the top decompression of the opposite side uh, uh, a little bit of the lamina and facet. I have removed the part of the spinous process. So the base, and you can appreciate here as well. And here you see, I have cut the spinous process here. I've drilled it. And uh, from here to here, the uh, ligamentum flavum has been excised. And this is the post-op scan <laughs> after discectomy and decompression. This is immediate, almost around eight to 10 hours. So there's some element of fluid in there. This is the post-op. 
go stop and here i'll take a few more minutes okay so same case i'm discussing yes, we can it here okay so so the sheath is in uh, this is the uh, bipolar or rf electrode this is malleable uh, and uh, i am going through the uh, right side i think i forgot this okay so uh, i'll first show you the video un uninterrupted so i'm using the drill here to drill the lower part of the upper lamina and part of the sap the medial part of the sap so i'm creating more space here i am drilling the spinous process once the spinous process has been opened up i am opening up the ligamentum here because it's a case of canal stenosis i've used a bigger scope and i am using the typical kerosene rongers and full thickness uh, ligamentum flammum excision okay here i am going inferiorly <clears throat> this i am going on to the opposite side here i am doing a foraminotomy of the left side so i am going bang opposite here you see this is the foramen here see look at the beautiful foramen now i must tell you i have been doing tubular approaches for more than 10 years now and over the top such a beautiful demonstration is very very difficult or not possible through the tube Uh, so i feel this is a beautiful uh, uh, you know technique for over the top decompression of stenosis so here i am uh, decompressing this is on the right side so ipsilateral side this is the theca now what i have done here okay the part that has been missed here is in between these two steps i have changed my sheet so from a bigger sheath i have come down to a smaller sheath because i want a smaller sheath so that i don't retract this root too much if i have a big sheath there will be too much of retraction which i don't want that is why i changed the sheath and then the scope as well so here the root is being separated the sheath has been rotated this is the trephine i am using to open up then the discectomy then i would be decompressing the axilla as well here you can see the axilla so this is the exiting root and the axilla inferiorly again this demonstration is also very beautiful through the pure endoscopic approach so the root here root here the complete theca is free opposite root has been decompressed i have gone right from this part and discectomy lower down a tegmen incision and uh, this is the post op which i already shared with you okay right so yeah fine great so i think uh, i've covered the basics and some uh, some some advanced points as well, as far as uh, uh, pure interlaminar is concerned endoscopic approach uh, i'm extremely thankful once again uh, to john for this opportunity and to all of you for uh, uh, watching this presentation and i hope uh, Uh, you are able to take up this uh, approach uh, I, i would be more than happy to uh, answer the questions if there are any okay questions. there was one question i thought there was one question go ahead okay uh 
it's we have always work at shoulder okay nina uh, see uh, okay there is if you go into literature this you know i have just come across maybe around 6 months back there is something and i think it's from an indian author uh, it's been published uh, i am forgetting the journal it is called the kissing sign kissing sign here if you have a kissing sign positive it's an axillary disc so you can go right into the axilla and remove the disc <coughs> and then go to the shoulder but uh, uh, in for me 80 to 85% i'll go to the shoulder first like we do in a tubular approach or a micro discectomy and then remove or decompress the disc loosen out the uh, root and theca and then do more of mobilization though i must say that uh, uh, dealing with axillary discs is much easier through this through this approach very good uh, neil uh, we have to wrap it up excuse me uh, ashish we have to wrap it up now we have another but we had a good good interactivity if we keep working at it we're going to get better and better yeah yeah and I, i think they can post their questions to me on uh, the email or through you and uh, or they can call me uh, i would be more than willing to answer their questions okay maybe put, so your, put posting, your email address in your chat in the chat there that might make it blue yeah i am putting my email address as well yeah so it's dr ashish at gmail.com and the site would be www.advancedneurosurgery.com so you can contact me here uh thank you once again and i think we have another presentation so i'll take your leave uh, as a speaker from here right now thank you so much okay ashish we'll wrap it up and we'll see you